bring me your tired, your stressed, your overwhelmed and anxious, yearning for some joy in life. It's time to go out and play. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Playgrounding. This is Kara Stuart Fortier, and today I have some breaking news for you. Apparently, we have a lot of problems in the world right now. Yeah. In case you hadn't noticed, we have big, complex issues that need actual, real solutions, but none of it is being solved right now because we haven't figured out a way to talk to each other. Right now, everything feels like a stalemate. Um, it's kind of the my way or the highway kind of thing for everyone on all sides. And the problem that we're all so frustrated with is that no matter how right we feel we are, no matter how much research we've done, whatever issue, whatever it is, there just seems to be no consensus. And this is in Washington, D.C. or whatever the capital of, you know, I hope your country is doing better than, than this one is. Um, but this is also on the street in protests. There just doesn't seem to be a lot of give on um yeah, there's no consensus being reached there. Um, there's also our family members at the dinner table, our friends, um, if we're going to argue. And I think the most insidious form of this is that when someone disagrees or when if someone doesn't accept your solution 100 percent, not just you, but like the, the general we, if someone doesn't accept our, our solution um, so much more often than not, the answer is that not only are you wrong, but you're bad. And then relationships start to dissolve and we start devolving into arguments on Facebook and all the fun stuff that keep us at this stalemate. So the question we're going to talk about today is this. Are we really truly suck? Are we really so doomed? Are we doomed to failure right now because all of the tools that we're using right now aren't working and the way we're trying to solve these problems to build consensus don't seem to be working? Is that it? Are we just stuck here? Or is it possible to create something brand new? Is it possible to invent new tools so we can talk to each other and reach consensus and try to move forward for the sake of the generations that come after us? Because maybe, maybe we're following a script, the only script that we knew, but maybe that script is not working and we need to throw it out. Maybe we need to start improvising. And that is exactly what we're going to be talking about today in our conversation with Marion Rich and Carrie Loebman of the East Side Institute. They are co-authors of the chapter called Playing Around with Changing the World about the East Side Institute's international class in a book that's called The Applied Improvisation Mindset. Now, it's set to be published by Bloomsbury Press in early 2021. So before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about Marion and Carrie. Marion Rich is an international performance activist, actress, comedic improviser, and theatrical director who has spent over 30 years leading playful workshops and programs in which people come together to grow and develop. As faculty at the Eastside Institute, she leads playful and philosophical sessions during the Institute's international class residencies. They are they impact activists, educators, and scholars from around the world who are looking for ways to infuse their work with the power of performance. She is a co-founder of the Global Play Brigade also, which is something I like quite a bit. Um, Carrie Loebman, she's a doctor of education, and she's an associate professor and chair of the Department of Learning and Teaching at Rutgers University Graduate School of Education. She's also the leader of education and research at the Eastside Institute and a member of the National Board of Directors of the All-Stars. Carrie is a sociocultural scholar and play movement leader. Her research examines the relationship between play, performance, learning, and development for people of all ages. She facilitates a webinar series called Play, Development, and Social Justice and serves as a mentor to emerging performance activists around the world and is on the board of directors for the All-Stars Project, a national leader in after-school development. Carrie is the author or editor of three books, Unscripted Learning, Using Improvisation Across the K-8 Curriculum, Big Ideas and Revolutionary Activity, Selected Essays, Talks, and Articles by Lois Holtzman, and Performance and Play, Play and Culture Series, Volume 11. She has authored dozens of articles. She received her doctorate from Teachers College, Columbia University, and is a past president of the Association for the Study of Play and Cultural Historical Activity Theory, SIG, of the American Educational Research Association. All right, let's get to it. Here's Marion and Carrie. 
Wow, what an amazing honor it is to have the two of you on together. Um, and we have Mary and Rich, and we have Carrie Loebman, and I am honored. Thank you for Thank having, you for having us. coming on the show. Yeah, this is Pleasure. this is really incredible. Um, I've been getting to know um, the Global Play Brigade, Marion. That's how I met you, and then you're yeah. working on this work with Carrie. And um, maybe you introduce yourselves for us. Great. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> I'll go, <laughs> go ahead, Marion. Um, so uh, there's there's many ways to introduce oneself, but I'll go the play route. <laughs> given where we are and who we're with. Um, so I'm a, a longtime actress, comedian, improviser, teacher. And um, I think it was about 15 years ago or something, I gave up scripted theater for the life of an improviser. Wow. And um, I'm also a faculty member at the Eastside Institute. I'll let Carrie say a little bit more about the Eastside Institute. And um, I've been teaching activists and scholars and educators, community organizers, uh, people from around the world who want to infuse their work to change the world with play. Mm -hmm. and performance and improvisation. So that's become very, very important work to me. And I'm one of the co-founders of the Global Play Brigade. And I also do applied improvisation work in corporate settings, though I must say since the pandemic, I'm pretty focused on, as I've been for a very long time, most <laughs> of my adult life, in changing the world. So mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, that's a little bit about me. I'll start there. <laughs> okay, I'll great. Kick it over to Carrie. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Um, I have I have sort of a multi a multi location life. So I am a professor of education at Rutgers University um, in New Jersey. I am the chair of the Department of Learning and Teaching. Um, I'm our primary. Um, in addition to being educational researchers, we also prepare teachers at all levels at, at Rutgers. And I am the um, pro bono leader of education and research at the Eastside Institute, which Marion mentioned. So the Eastside Institute is a completely, it's a sort of, it's a unique in, in, as far as I know, in that it's a completely independent research and training center. So there's many, um, centers and institutes around the world, and most of them have a relationship to a university. Um, and the Eastside Institute, which grew up out of activism, um, does not. It has a, it's independently funded, um, and it's independently and volunteer-led. Mm -hmm. um, so what we've done for the last 40 years is really been able to experiment and develop what we think of as a new approach to human development. Um, which puts our ability to play and perform and create at front and center of what's needed for us to grow as individuals, as families, as communities, and frankly, at this point, as a species. Um, and so my job there is, if you will, at this point, to develop our curriculum, our offerings, um, to work as one of the many people who we have a broad network of community organizers around the world that who consider themselves performance activists. And we both are created by them and we serve them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the things that we develop and offer are to support the development of leaders around the world who can then lead others. Um, and I've been in that, um, Lois Holtzman, our director and co-founder, kind of her primary partner in developing our international training work, um, both before the pandemic by traveling around the world and doing that with people and um, here in New York and now mostly virtually online. Wow. Well, I, I've really enjoyed, you sent me a chapter of your upcoming book and I am just, it, it, it really was a kind of a game changer in my mind. We've talked a lot on the podcast about activism and play and sometimes that kind of comes across as being a little more creative, doing some mm. different kinds of maybe more daring things, be more playful in the way you are an activist. Um, what you're talking about goes 
I mean, we, we've also talked about, you know, the All Stars project with and, and the kids playing with the police is doing improv. But I feel like there's just something so much deeper into not only how we learn, learn, but how we see ourselves and perform in the world on a daily basis, not just in a workshop or something like that. And that all kind of starts off you in your paper that you sent me in the chapter with social therapeutics. Could you kind of give me an idea of what social therapeutics is so we can kind of launch from there? Sure. So, um, I mean, at, at a very basic level, it's the name of the approach that we've developed at the Institute, but you might say, well, an approach to what? Mm -hmm. um, so starting starting really at the beginning, our co-founders, um, the late Dr. Fred Newman, and who was a philosopher and a therapist and a playwright um, and an activist, and Lois Holtzman, who was trained as a developmental psychologist. I think when you say um, it feels deeper, I think that's because the task they set for themselves and us was nothing short than challenging the basic assumptions of psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and so some people might say, well, psychology, that's a subject you study in school, or it's something that certain people do. They do psychology. They, But what the, we're talking about is the psychology that has kind of dominated how certainly people in the Western world, but now I would argue people everywhere, since that's been the hegemonic approach for, for several hundred years now, mm -hmm. how we understand what a human being is. Um, so for most of the last three or 400 years, human beings have been defined by that we are thinkers and we are reactors, right? Yep. We, we, are, we, we are primarily what makes us different than animals is we're cognitive, we think. Um, and obviously thinking is one of the many things we can do, often more than we should. <laughs> but, right um, here. <laughs> <laughs> what, what social therapeutics attempts to do is shift our gaze to that we are the species that created the concept of thinking. We are the species that created the concept of self. We are the species. We are creators and performers of our lives and of everything that humanity has created, good and bad, and there's much of both. And that in psychology, kind of not focusing on that, we've become alienated from our ability to continuously create and recreate. Um, and for us, that's the key to transforming the world. And, um, and at a moment in which for most people, for many people, development in the sense of continuously creating new performances has been stifled mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, the need to shed light on our ability to reignite that and to create environments where people can do that, can create new ways of relating to each other, new ways of doing government, new ways of doing education, um, new ways of doing therapy. If we don't create in creating spaces where you can question the assumptions and begin to create something new, that's how we're going to transform. So social therapeutics is the practice we've created that, that, that certainly we we have experienced sparks that for people. But the interesting thing about it is we're not looking to have everybody do it the way we are doing it, because that would be the opposite of what we're saying. <laughs> yes. So it's in some ways, it's giving people the ability to become tool creators themselves. We got that from the Soviet psychologist Lev Vygotsky, that we use tools, but we can also create them. And so social therapeutics is a methodology for reigniting tool creation around the world. Can I, I just want Absolutely. to, yes, and hardly, <laughs> yes, and uh, what Carrie shared, as a practitioner of social therapeutics, I think the most important thing I carry in my toolkit <laughs> is um, seeing the group. So I think uh, traditionally psychology says development is individualized, that, that it's all about the individual. But mm -hmm. of course, um, you know, when you're playing as adults, often uh, if you're taking an improv class, you're in a circle and you're playing some game, you're mm -hmm. passing a synchronized clap or whatever you're doing. And you can see that circle as a grouping of individuals. And you can also see that as a group. 
uh, there's a dialectical relationship mm-hmm. because the group, of course, is made up of individuals. Yeah. When social therapeutics, we would say that the development that happens, the, the growth that happens through play, through co-creating, happens to the group. Mm. Uh, that is radically different yeah. than how traditional psychology understands development to the extent to which it does. <laughs> and I think social therapeutics also turns that on its head. But I, I think as a practitioner, as somebody who plays with groups, uh, online, offline, that's the focus that we have. We're, we're seeing where the group is at and then addressing the group. And the individuals are taken care of because they're included. In the group. Yep, absolutely. And I think one of the concepts that um, really stood out to me with this, and it helped me kind of connect some dots that I'd been sort of dangling out there in the air when I'm trying to understand all of this, was the idea of being and becoming mm-hmm. and how this is something that a child um, understands. So, like, what you're introducing is not something that we humans haven't done before. It's uh-huh. maybe what we adults have a hard time with, but being and becoming, um, I'm just going to let you talk, but I, if you could maybe speak to that, because I just feel like that's a really important concept that p- any, everyone, I think any listeners, anyone will get a lot out of just understanding that. Tara, before we do that, could you say what, what, what's it, your face lights up when you say it, what is it about that, that, that <laughs> strikes a chord for you? Cause it might help us then speak to, to that and, and advance that and build with you. <laughs> well, actually it's, it's kind of strange. So the first thing that came to my mind, um, I am a singer. I've been a singer my whole life. I led bands, blah, blah, blah. But I've always had this problem if I sing too long, like I could just never quite do, I I took so many classes and everything um, to try to like get rid of whatever this block is that was Mm -hmm. making it so hard for me. And one time I was I was playing with some friends, just we were being silly. And I decided I was going to pretend to be Beyonce or something. And I just started pretending I was Beyonce and I just started singing and this voice came out that stopped me. I was like, how did I do that? I mean, because my voice teacher was working with me to have one hand on my belly, one hand on my th- neck, making sure nothing was moving. And I was trying to do these exercises. And that's how I was trying to learn it. Mm. And I'm sure it's possible to do that. But in that moment, it was just there. My mm-hmm. voice. And, I, and I've learned a lot through like acting classes and different performing stuff that we lose track of ways of breathing and ways of standing and everything that when we were kids is just natural. And so this idea of thinking of ways of being as a kid and, and the way that we take for what we take for granted as a child and moving into our adult life where everything is suddenly scripted. Mm -hmm. And I know, and I understand, I have a good understanding now what happened with me with my voice. I was trying so hard to do specific things with it that my voice was not meant to do. Um, And now I don't do that anymore, but it took me so many years to learn that. And so when I read about this idea of being and becoming that you're always, you always are who you are, but you're also in this, you have this capacity to be something else, Mm -hmm. not like in a, I'm not satisfied with who I am kind of sense. Cause I think when I read it before, that's what I thought it was. Mm. Um, and I wasn't sure. I mean, I didn't understand, yeah, yeah. but, but now that I've read this paper and I, I, that's what stood out to me. So sorry, I didn't mean to be the, um, <laughs> no, that's, interview. I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. I think the thing you just said about that, the, that you, that we tend to see being who you are and who you are not, or who you are becoming you, you had this little aside of not that you don't have to, not, as if they're on opposites, right? That yeah, either yeah. you like who you are or you want to be something different. Yes. Right. And, and we do tend to see everything in dichotomies um, in the world. And so to me, what's, what is, what's so exciting about your excitement about it is mm-hmm. that it's a window onto n- not seeing things dualistically. And yes. With young children, it's not just that they, it's that we support them to be who they are and who they're becoming. True. The ensemble, as Marion was saying, the group does that, right? Mm -hmm. So it would be ludicrous to relate to a (laughs) nine-month-old as a non-speaker, right? Oh, we're not going to talk to them because they don't really speak. So (laughs) we're going to wait 
because they don't get to be, we no, we speak to them all the time. We speak to them when they're two weeks old. We, we engage with them as part of the community of people who are becoming speakers. And we do that w- with four-year-olds too, right? They sit down next to them and say, can I read you a book? Yeah. And we don't correct what they're reading. We don't say, no, you don't really know how to read. I'm, I get a little bored when we relate to them as readers. And so I think where the shift happens is actually in in the society, in the relationships, not in the individual child. Ooh, right? that's good. Oh, we get man. to a point where what we value and the is what people can do. That's what we start valuing and looking for and rewarding, not that creative activity that's what you can't and can do all at the same time and supporting that activity as we get older. And um so to me, what being and becoming is, is not a, it's not a new thing. It's a description of what human beings are able to do, which yeah. is as far as we know, as far as we know, I mean, all animals grow in that way as puppies and kittens <laughs> and all of those things. But, but we, can, we can decide to not just be who we are. We can, and it's not even a cognitive activity. We can, we can pretend, as you said, to be Beyonce. <laughs> um so that's yeah I think for me what's exciting about it is that it it is a description of human development and it is a tool for reinitiating it all at the same time. Mm-hmm. And Marion yeah. is a master at creating an environment where people can do that. Oh, ah, thanks, Thank the nurturer. You. That's very sweet. <laughs> I mean the thing I I wanted to add is um so Carrie mentioned Fred Newman Mm-hmm. who was the co-founder of the Eastside Institute. Fred was also the artistic director of the Castillo Theater in New York, which is uh, the theater of the All-Stars Project. And uh, I was one of the actors in Fred's ensemble for many years. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, Fred had a radio show years ago called Let's Develop where it was a call-in radio show on AM radio in New York. And I used to call in every week because I'm like, I don't know, Fred's giving free therapy. I'm calling (laughs) in. And I I think this was the context that we had this conversation that's never left me. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it was very mundane uh, kind of question that I was beginning to date uh, the man who's now my husband, and I, uh, and he was crazy enough to let me call into a radio show and talk about our very early relationship. And I was concerned because we were doing a lot of like baby talk, you know, that you do like, <laughs> hello, three, you know, booby, hi, pookie. And, um, and I think it was in that context that Fred had shared with me that, well, look, Marion, you're always who you were. You're always that kid. A kid never leaves you. You're always a kid. Uh, Who you are, whoever you are now, and who you're becoming. Mm. You're all those things at once, all the time. And life is the interplay of all of that. And I don't think I had a clue really what he was talking about. (laughs) Yeah, this was like 20 years ago. I just thought it sounded cool. Mm -hmm. But I think I've grown into not a cognitive understanding of that, but a life activity through my own development and seeing other people develop. And the Beyonce story is the story. Hmm. Um, like actually when Carrie was just talking, I thought, wouldn't it be great if every woman in the world would perform as Beyonce? (laughs) That would, that is a strange, uh, avenue for women's empowerment, but not a bad one. No. Um, so it's so creative (laughs) and that's so much a part of this approach to, to development is to create our lives and in creating our new performances, we become. Yeah. And then one day you realize, Oh, that used to be a performance and Oh, that's who I am. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, how I, the I, hell I, did that happen? And the, and the greatest part of all of it, and I think the reason why it happened with trying to sing that song was because I sound nothing like Beyonce, and I knew yeah. that. Mm-hmm. I was just trying to channel the the sass and the fun, and yeah. by doing that, I wasn't thinking about trying to sound like her because I knew I wouldn't. But it was that it's so fascinating that as soon as you let yeah. go of that, and then when I tried to go back and do it again, nope, nothing. <laughs> it took me years to figure that out. Just do it. Be in that moment now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, love that. Oh well, man! One of the great tools that young children have is they imitate. Yeah, and that is one that's of right. the tools again that gets taken away from us for the most part at school. Uh-huh. Right? It starts being called cheating. Or be your true self, be yeah. your real self. Don't do authentic that. Authentic self. Be authentic, and and it it really stifles one of the what makes us most able to grow, which is out is that we have the ability to imitate others, and that imitation is not we call it creative imitation because we're actually not capable of being Beyonce, Mm-mm. just like Beyonce <laughs> is not capable of being Kara. Yeah, true. So, <laughs> so her loss, but there you go. But, uh, and we can. Um, so it's interesting when you say you weren't able to do it again, because in some ways, I think the it we have to do again and again is not yes. the content of that, yes. but the activity of that. Yes, right? yes, yes. Not, that, I do think we, because there's a reason we can't do it again is because more often than not, what we're now trying to do is be that. Mm-hmm. Get it right is... Script you know, it again. Yes. Yeah. And so I think the, the, the thing that we have to get better at is over and over again, the, we're not a process culture. Mm-hmm. And being and becoming is about the relationship between process and product. It's not one or the other. Wow. Yeah. So that's what I think you could do. You could do that every day and and it would never look the same. No, no, it's amazing. And there are so many applications for this that you guys, um, that you, I know you marry and you lead workshops for this and what you do at the Eastside Institute um, and your international class and what you're describing in this book. Um, there were a few examples in the chapter, but I'm just going to let you guys sort of pull out some examples of how this works in what you do at the Eastside Institute um, and what applied improvisation means. Let's just start there because that's a very specific thing. All right, it's not I'll going take, to see the groundlings. <laughs> I'll take applied improv and, okay. then, and then I'll kick it over to Carrie to talk about uh, ten questions the, at once. <laughs> the international class, yeah, and, and then we can talk a little bit about what that looks like. So, um, the chapter that we're writing is part of a book that's being edited um, by two colleagues from the Applied Improvisation Network: Caitlin McClure and Teresa. Um, Robbins Dudek, and uh, they they had a volume one, which is called Applied Improvisation. I happen to have it here. Yay. Plug for the book, Leading, Collaborating, and Creating Beyond the Theater. Mm-hmm. So um, really, applied improvisation is lifting the tools from the theater, from improvisation, from the theater. Um, as a formally trained actor, I've I've improvised uh, plays, not comic improv. So there's also dramatic improvisation, Mm -hmm. just improvising a scene. It's a way that directors work, that actors work. All the way from that to Second City, you know, comedy improv, uh, Del Close, the whole history of Viola Spolin, uh, mm. et cetera, et cetera, that very rich history. So taking all these incredible tools, lifting them out of the theater, <laughs> although I go with Shakespeare that all of the world's a stage, but nevertheless, <laughs> lifting them out and putting them in other settings. So mm. I know you interviewed Kathy Salit, who's a colleague of ours and the chief organizer of the Global Play Brigade, Kathy, for many years, was the president of Performance of a Lifetime. Now Maureen Kelly and Savan Kasargian run that organization, and they are masters at that. So along with many other, you know, really talented people in other organizations, Mm -hmm. I could name dozens of them. (laughs) Um, And 
uh, they do that in corporate America. Other people do it in uh, medical settings. Uh, we have colleagues, Susan Masson and Mary Fridley, who've created something called the Joy of Dementia, bringing improv and play to caregivers for people with dementia. Wow. All of these are applied improv. So, so taking games and play and exercises, yes, and all <laughs> that, and bringing it to communities, to activities that uh, typically are not using play. Uh, Tony Perone, who, who mm -hmm. connected us, uh, a very dear colleague of yours and ours, mm -hmm. is a professor of play, like Carrie is. Um, that's not exactly applied improv in the work that they well, I guess it is as an educator. Yeah, you're also applying improvisation. So there is an organization called the Applied Improvisation Network. Okay. It's been around, I don't know, I want to say about a decade or more. And every year they have an annual conference. I've been to that conference uh, two years, 2018, 2019. Awesome. You meet people from every corner of the earth that are <laughs> using improv and play in this applied um, way. I think that what uh, we, we have found ourselves doing, uh, along with many others, is applying improv to changing the world. Mm -hmm. So- uh, It's big. <laughs> it's a big project, right? It's a big being, project. It's being and becoming. <laughs> being yes, and becoming, is. right? Absolutely. So we sponsor a conference called Performing the World. Yes. We've been doing that for 20 years. So we we the chapter we wrote is called Playing Around with Changing the World. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit about applied improvisation. Mm -hmm. And now if we can remember the other part of the question. Yeah, I kind of babbled that question <laughs> out there. Yeah. Carrie will we'll, yeah. we'll yes and, and so, take it from here. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, the, the Eastside Institute began long before we have certainly heard of applied improv. And, and maybe. True. Um, and so as with many of our discoveries, they had this wonderful characteristic that, again, I think has a relationship to being and becoming and is, is challenging to do within the constraints of traditional academic institutions, which is that we were, we were creating things. We created an independent school for many years um, to, challenge, to be an alternative to how traditional schooling stops letting children be and become, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We've created a therapy practice called social therapy, all these. And in doing that, we often then brought in both intellectual traditions and other communities that resonated with us, right? So we saw people, we saw people doing improv, our theater colleagues like Marion were doing improv and thought, oh, that helps us understand some of what we've been doing in our therapy work. Mm. We've been creating improvised conversations in our mm -hmm. therapy practice. So on the one hand, you could say it helps us explain it and describe it, but it also then helps you grow it and nurture it, right? Mm -hmm. So you start doing something, you see that there's a way to understand it, and then you let that way help you see new things and discover more. So that's in some ways our relationship to the applied improv world comes out of that, out of seeing some family resemblances, having wonderful, wonderful theater colleagues who were us and who were interested in it, and then letting that develop what we were doing um, as well. So the international class, which Marion is our improv teacher of, and um, I am one of the members of the core faculty. It's led by Lois Holtzman, our director. I, I was thinking when you were describing, when you were asking sort of, well, what, what does this look like in mm -hmm. practice? Um, one way to think about it is starting about 15 to 20 years ago, we, we began to realize that there were many people around the world who were challenging traditional ways of changing the world. Mm -hmm. um, people do that through the arts. People do that through... Um, you know, going back into communities and rather than trying to do a top-down approach, 
trying to build grassroots movements there. People do it through um, supporting educational approaches and and that, but that more and more people were looking for creative ways to do that, that break from traditional ideological step-by-step. Step. If you do this, if you do this, then you can do that, change the world, right? Mm-hmm. And so we started um, meeting those people, telling them we thought they were performance activists. Oh, so, um, telling them we thought they were the new psychologists, that in, that in being people who were helping communities grow, they were creating a new psychology. Um, and people wanted more. They wanted to learn from us. So we created the international class. Our first class graduated in 2004. Um, and one way to think about it is it's, it's a leadership training program. Okay. But another way to think about it is it's, is it's reigniting people's own development so that they could develop the people that they're working with. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I think in theatrical terms... It's helping people see that one way to understand who they are is they are environment builders. They are stage creators. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, we mentioned something a few minutes ago that I think is the hardest thing for people to understand, to, to, to embrace in our work, which is that what we are doing, we call it tool and result, meaning we are, we are bringing into existence new tools that transform where we're going. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to a hammer, which is a tool for a particular job, (laughs) we're trying to create tools that actually create the job at the same time that you're creating the tool. So when I say that, I think it's a big, it's a big shakeup for a lot of people who are trying to change the world because world changing has for the last couple of hundred years been tied to a, you're trying to create a particular outcome. Mm-hmm. You're trying to elect a particular person. You're trying to overthrow a particular government. You're trying mm-hmm. to change a particular policy, and you're focused on that goal. And your tools are all in line with that. And what we're saying is, doesn't mean you don't have goals. You don't have things you want to go to. But if you're overly focused on tools for that, you miss half of what is transformative. For maybe eighty percent of what's transformative, which mm-hmm. is the creating of the ensemble the creating of the activities that you're going to do, the tools that you're going to use to do them. So in the international class, we are inviting people who are already, for the most part, skilled activists um, and skilled practitioners. So, for example, um, Sanjay Kumar is a theater activist in India. Um, For many years, ran a theater called, and still does, the Pandy's Theater, which um, creates theater for and about the most oppressed and abused segments of Indian society, including Mm -hmm. children who um, are in the sex trade and are living on platforms and, and are being murdered often. And he's created theater over the years that is all about activism. And I think he'd tell me if I was wrong, because Sanjay is very honest with me. (laughs) He came to us in some ways to, to broaden, not, not he was very very skilled he he was attracted to our approach that allowed one to break from traditional ideology to see some things and partner with some people that you maybe wouldn't before um but also to bring more process into the work and he's continued to do absolutely amazing political theater um and he's much more playful in how he goes about that in the world. Um, And I could, you know, there are, there are people from Africa, people from, so I think, I I think over the years, and we, we discovered this is what we were doing. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know that we knew we were doing that in 2004. That's awesome. Um, We had no (laughs) idea what we we, were uh, doing with many (laughs) of our projects. So, you know, and, and the way we do that is by asking, taking people to take a leap with us, which is that, that we are not, we don't, we're not going to tell them what to do because that is the opposite of the methodology. They are going to have to build the group that that builds the ensemble that allows us to teach them some things and allows them to teach each other much yeah. more. Um, and going through that is the learning. Yeah. 
Um, and one of the examples that you guys had in this chapter, um, it reminded me, I know a lot of people that are involved in activism and politics, law, that kind of thing. Like me, I was a debater. I was a philosophy major and all that stuff. So I was all about learning how to craft a great argument. Every paper, I had to be ready to defend it. Um, if I was going to take the dialectical method, you know, then I would just, you know, you feel like you always have to be ready with the exact right arguments. You have to be ready to hit them back and, you know, knock down mm. those, you know, um, this kind of just turns all of that on its head, yeah. knocks it over and says, no, we're going to try something completely different. And it's hard to even describe to somebody like me what that could even possibly look like. Um, but then you, you give this example of a class exercise um, where before the, the exercise began, it was made aware that somebody in the class was feeling triggered mm. and upset. And um, you changed the exercise completely in order to do this thing that I, I, I just sat there reading this, like, is that real? Could that be real? <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about that piece of the chapter? Um, yeah, I'd love to. Um, so literally, I well, Lois Holzman and I and Carrie have a very emergent way of working. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm the improv person and I work improvisationally. And I like to get some direction from Carrie and Lois, like what's happening with the class? What are they working on? So I had a plan. I had done that. And I had a plan of, you know, some activities. And I come into the... Eastside Institute and Lois like pulls me aside and says, well, uh, during, during this last session, there was a very heated discussion. And uh, one of the, co you know, the cohort said something to the other and um, you know, the other person said she felt triggered and it was upsetting and it was rancorous and it was difficult. And somebody in the, in the class said, well, you know, next we're, we have Mary. And so I don't know, maybe she could play around with it. <laughs> and Lois said to me, can you do that? And she gave me this just, <clears throat> Lois is uh, a spectacular teacher. <laughs> and thinker and, and activity activist. I, I just, she's uh, pretty awesome. She's my mentor. And she said, could you create an exercise? I had five minutes. Could you create an exercise that could play with like being triggered as though it's an offer? Like th that, that it could be part of, you know, what, what we play with. Um, mm -hmm. It's one more offer. Somebody says something hurtful. Mm -hmm. And it's not uh, just hurtful. It's, it's bringing up a past experience. It's bringing that, up yeah. a past experience, you know, whatever that is. And, and you know, triggering isn't like language mm -hmm. that we use a lot in the, or at all really within social therapy or social therapeutics, but it's, it's become part of you know, people's vocabulary yeah, emotionally yeah. and, and uh, psychologically and all. So, so the thing I thought of right away is, well, because this is a basic improv activity I do when I'm teaching improv, maybe I could set up some scenes to create a fight, <laughs> a trigger, and side coach them in such a way as to see if people could do something different than that. Yeah. <laughs> or that. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, oh, so for your listeners, I realize we're on video, you know, either punching, yeah, or, punching. or moving all the way back and, <laughs> and I love that your, your little Zoom I like how flowers went. Flowers yeah. went <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, you know, people shut down. Yeah. And yeah. they feel triggered mm -hmm. and they, they remove themselves from the relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I'm always interested in is relationality is yes. could you do something so radical as to move closer in a moment of feeling triggered? Is that mm -hmm. even remotely possible? And I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> and we did a couple of scenes mm -hmm. like that 
at the moment at which people did start fighting, I said, freeze. I, I asked, are we at that moment? Are they, it, is somebody about to get triggered? <laughs> yeah, it's getting pretty tense. And then I would sort of slow, it's like putting everything into slow motion. Mm -hmm. So, okay, freeze. You're not looking at each other. Oof. Continue, but start with 10 seconds of direct eye contact before anybody speaks. You know, those kinds of side coaching. Mm -hmm. um, also, when people weren't hearing each other. So, Carrie just said that You've always been a difficult sister to Kara. Kara, do you want to slow down and mm. respond, breathe, take that in, and really respond without necessarily being reactive? But can you give something back <sighs> to Kara? Could you be? And yeah, I, I, I like that you're responding like, oof. Yeah, no, and you because said that there was hard. silence. That silence was people didn't know what to do. Yeah, you know, it's, <laughs> it's hard work. But imagine what our country and our world would be like if we we could do that. Because mm -hmm. I think people are again, you know, I'm going to use this word getting triggered, um, mm -hmm. even though I have some difficulty with it, but. That's not what this podcast is about. Um, <laughs> I think it's hurtful. Mm -hmm. That whole notion ends up being hurtful to people. Mm -hmm. and doesn't have to be. And I don't take away people's trauma in life. Mm -hmm. Life life is traumatic. I think mm -hmm. human life is traumatic. Uh, some more, some less. It's hard to get through life without a trauma of some kind. Anyway, um, it takes work. Mm -hmm. But that's the kind of work that could create a new world. Yeah. You know what's so interesting in listening, to, in slowing down to listen to Marion's description, I think I maybe saw something in the activity that I hadn't seen or I hadn't, I hadn't highlighted before in my, which is this is all being done in a social context with a whole other grouping of people, your, your classmates in this case, and Marion. So one could say, well, how much better the world would be if in the moment you and I, Kara, were alone together and I said something, you, but how much even more better it would be, <laughs> more better, if we then pick, call, said, hey, could you guys come over here to some random group oh. of people? Like, we, we need a little side coaching here. Like, what should I say? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> because that in some ways takes the focus away from just changing how people react to each other to challenging the idea that what we are doing is reacting to each other. Yeah. As opposed to creating endless scenes and endless conversations mm -hmm. that are never in isolation. Even when you're alone, I mean, we've all spent a lot of time with just one or two, three, four people in the last few months. Yeah. Um, I've, I've realized how important it is to remember that my, the person I live with and I are, are not alone. It turns out there's a whole other family on the other side of the wall. And there's <laughs> two million people in the <laughs> neighborhood around me. And why would I decide that we're alone because we happen to have these walls around us? So I, yeah. when Marion was talking, I was thinking the focus in that activity, I think if people really want to be revolutionary, is mm -hmm. that our fights don't happen in isolation. No. And they don't just impact us. And so to what extent are we open to creating new performances that will never, in my opinion, come from inside of us? Because what's inside of us is the thing that we know to say. Mm -hmm. We need some well, other input. Prepared. Yeah. Sometimes the input can be Beyonce, imaginary. <laughs> right? But, Absolutely. But often, Absolutely. often you literally need somebody to say, well, try saying it this way. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Try, try tweaking this word. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the brilliances of Marion, and I think this does come from having been trained in large part by Fred Newman, who was a philosopher, and is that, is, is that we're not looking to create a better scene. Right. Mm -hmm. We're looking to create a different scene. Mm 
a scene yes. that has that where that exposes that we are creating the scene. Yep. And there is no guarantee it will be any kinder, any sweeter, any more wonderful and roses. And <laughs> and in my experience, actually, the ones that are most impactful afterwards are the ones that don't resolve the conflict, right. but give us another way to see it and to and to experience it in a more human way of understanding, oh, that other person is also a human being. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even if you get in those scenes, 30 seconds of seeing the other mm -hmm. full stop. Yeah. Or seeing the other in a way you've never seen before. Yeah. Wow. What a difference. And it has nothing to do with ideology. No, it doesn't. That's so important. Yeah. And the, the idea, like you, you mentioned in there, like play, being playful in the face of an argument, or in the face, mm -hmm. face of anger. Yeah. And it just, when people would hear that without any of this context, it sounds like you're just making light of it or being silly right, yes. or like being mischievous. Yes. But it's so much deeper than that. And I just really appreciate you guys, this work that you've been doing all these years and, the, the, and you're writing on it and pursuing this. It's just such an amazing I mean, I, I wish that we could get like two people on different sides of this spectrum that are fighting right now that the, the same things are on the, all the news channels now, you mm -hmm. know, about the, what's happening with uh, defund the police and things like that. If we could have Marion on the side coaching, side coaching the world, <laughs> Marion, side coaching the world, <laughs> just have like a debate or have like two people yeah. on opposite sides of it actually yeah. have a conversation, but with Marion going, stop. <laughs> you can't. Yeah, so yeah. that's my yeah. my hope for the world is that we will have an amazing coach like Marianne. <laughs> Mine <laughs> well, too. Thank you Mine guys too. so much oh, for this interview. Yeah. This is fantastic. Oh. And Kara, thank, thank you for you. your enthusiasm. It's, yeah. <laughs> you you yeah. Don't, you 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 should perform as you, people should perform as yeah. you. Aww. Yeah, it's true. That's what I was trying to it's say. True. Well, it took me so long to find me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, oh. that's a whole other podcast. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. That's it. Thank you so much for joining me for another week, and I hope you join again next week. Don't forget, playgrounding is supported by listeners like you. All you have to do is subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you don't mind, leaving us a little review so that other people can find us. Thank you so much. <laughs>